Hello viewers, welcome back to History Facts. Today we are discussing the intimacy lives of the Karayuki-san, the Japanese working girls. Enjoy the video and have a good time. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Japanese women from impoverished rural communities became a new international workforce called the Karayuki-san. Karayuki-san were sex workers positioned throughout Asia using an exploitative system of human trafficking. Like in some countries today, sex work was a legal profession throughout Southeast Asia. The Karayuki-san helped bring Japanese culture and goods to the rest of Asia and established the Red Light District in Singapore. These sex workers were sent to Australia throughout Southeast Asia and into the hands of European imperialists in the region. The distribution of Karayuki-san was an international business enterprise. Starting in 1877 in two brothels in colonial Singapore, Japanese sex workers known as Karayuki-san translated literally as going to China or going to a foreign land were hired primarily from peasant families in the Nagasaki region. Flesh brokers sold or coerced these women into service and trafficked them throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The two establishments in the 1870s started with as few as 14 workers, but those establishments grew into Singapore's red light district in the following decades. As Japan expanded its imperial interests and grew its economy, the state became aware of the importance of sex work in establishing political relations with Europe's colonial powers. Throughout Southeast Asia, men were imported from across Europe's colonial empires, and Japanese merchants brought Karayuki-san to China and Southeast Asia to satisfy the needs of those men. The women weren't told they would be working girls. Mediators negotiated with poor rural families to recruit girls for relocation overseas. They were told they would have opportunities to make money, but not that they were being sold as sex workers. Some girls and women went on their own, without their family's involvement. The mediators would then find a ship captain willing to take the women. Once they arrived at the destination, the mediator would sell them for between 20 to 300 yen. The young women were exploited, they were charged hefty fees to be taken abroad, which they were required to pay back. In one case, a girl from Nagasaki named USA was brought to Thursday Island, a small island off the northern coast of Australia. There, she made an agreement with the brothel keeper to use a large portion of her earnings to pay for her transportation, considerably more than the cost of a regular ticket between Japan and Thursday Island. Many Karayuki-san perished traveling overseas. There were many hazards for Karayuki-san. Mediators and ship captains often forced the women to stow away in small, compact areas of a ship to smuggle them into ports. The cramped quarters proved hazardous. One ship carrying women and men from Japan to Hong Kong began with 12 stowaways, but by the time they reached port in Hong Kong, eight had passed. The four who survived nearly suffocated and arrived in critical condition. Women who were told to hide in coal reserves could be crushed or burned by coal spontaneously combusting. Others starved or perished due to dehydration. On one ship, traveling between Nagasaki and Hong Kong, nine women and two men were scalded when a boiler burst. Brothels told many Karayuki-san that they were a part of Japan's war effort. In the late 19th century, Japan went through the Meiji Restoration, which modernized economic, social, and political policy throughout Japan. One of the most important effects was its introduction of Japan on the global stage as an expansionist power. Before World War I, Japan entered two conflicts to aid their new imperial policy. During the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-1895, Japan challenged Chinese supremacy over the Korean Peninsula, a decade later, Japan fought the Russian Empire in the Russo-Japanese War to prevent further European expansion into East Asia. Japan won both, cemented a reputation as a developed global power, and inspired a militaristic national pride. Everyone was encouraged to be a part of the national effort, including the women who went to work as Karayuki-san. 
Brothel owners used the nation's newfound patriotism to persuade the women they served as a female army, contributing on behalf of their country. By 1910, there were thousands of Japanese sex workers overseas. The number of Karayuki-san overseas expanded quickly. Though there were only 14 in Singapore in 1877, by 1910, an estimated 20,000 registered Japanese sex workers were working outside Japan. Ships sailed from port to port, selling women in Kuala Lumpur, Malaya, and Java. Within the Malay Peninsula, around 90% of all Caucasian men had an Asian concubine, and many are assumed to have been Japanese. In most cases, Karayuki-san were popular with Caucasian men, as compared to Malay and Indonesian concubines, Karayuki-san were able to leave their employer's service when the white men wanted to take wives from their mother countries. Karayuki-san had some small freedoms. Karayuki-san were allowed to go out during the day and weren't punished if they didn't meet a daily quota of customers. The Yokosan, literally mother, didn't meddle in a Karayuki-san's personal affairs, they had a relationship more akin to that of a debtor and creditor. The Yokosan would collect a share of the Karayuki-san's wages and keep track of her debts, in exchange for housing, clothing, travel, and other expenses. Karayuki-san could make more money than many Japanese workers. Brothels were open seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and Karayuki-san worked long hours. The standard fee to hire a Karayuki-san in Singapore before World War I was $5. Most women could earn anywhere from $75 to $150 each month, and those who made more than $150 were regularly given an extra allowance from their okasan. Within a month or two, Karayuki-san made the equivalent of a female Japanese factory worker's yearly income. Many did not leave the profession, because they knew there was no guarantee of finding new work that paid as well. Karayuki-san opened Japanese markets in foreign countries. Karayuki-san helped develop Japanese economic expansion abroad. Many Japanese merchants and professionals moved overseas to supply the needs of the Karayuki-san, who had high demands for Japanese sundries, kimonos, doctors, and much more. In 1903, over 70% of the Japanese community in Singapore was directly engaged in providing services for the sex industry. Though many businesses that solely catered to the industry did not survive for long, they began Japan's economic ventures abroad. Japan came to view Karayuki-san with shame. As Japan became present on the global stage, society began to view Karayuki-san as a shameful and negative aspect of Japan's national image. Many Karayuki-san were forcefully repatriated back to Japan, but it hurt the women's well-being and economic livelihood. Upon their return, they were often discriminated against and shamed by both the public and their own families. Many women chose to remain overseas and continue sex work rather than face stigmatization back home. Japan tried to erase the existence of Karayuki-san from history. The thousands of sex workers who left Japan during the late 19th and early 20th centuries are omitted from Japanese history books and mostly from historical memory. One Japanese expatriate only discovered the existence of the Karayuki-san after spending time in Singapore. According to her, she was saddened to realize that she had known nothing about Karayuki-san. She is now a tour guide and tells their stories. Thanks for watching. Do like, subscribe and comment.